Thank you for viewing this recorded Reliable Automatic Sprinkler Company webinar. Should you have any questions regarding this presentation, please feel free to contact Reliable Technical Services at 800-557-2726 or email us at techserve at reliablesprinkler.com. For upcoming webcasts and an archive of past webcasts, please visit reliablesprinkler.com slash webcasts. Once again, Thank you and enjoy the presentation. So we've seen a lot of attention paid lately to sprinkler pipe corrosion. Uh, the latest edition of Sprinkler Age focused on that. There were four or five separate articles on the issue of fire sprinkler piping corrosion. Uh, there's probably not a week goes by where we don't see a webinar um being uh, addressed to that very topic most uh, most recently in the industry with uh, regard to nitrogen generation and things like that but today uh, we're going to take a look at the at the device that holds that water in the piping let's assume our piping is good um, now we've got a device that's actually holding water in the piping and, and in this case we're going to talk about that very specific device the fire sprinkler itself So let's start with the word corrosion. Uh, the word corrosion is, is from a Latin word which means to gnaw away, um, to eat away very slowly in small parts. Uh, corrosion is a natural process. Uh, it converts a refined metal, right, um, our fire sprinkler or a piping, into a what's called a more chemically stable form, such as an oxide, uh, hydroxide, or sulfide. Right, it's the it's the process of the metal trying to get back to its original state, uh, the gradual destruction of materials, and and we're usually talking about a metal, uh, either by a chemical uh, or and or the electrochemical reaction with its environment. So, uh, I'm an avid reader. Uh, one of the things that caught my interest lately was the concept of entropy, uh, and, and what entropy basically means is that the the natural order of the universe is chaos okay that's that's where the universe would like to get to is chaos um, and so or what we call ordered materials or finished materials like a fire sprinkler are always trying to revert back to their natural disordered state right it's going to eventually go back into the parts that it started from over time and it takes energy to keep things in order and so what we're going to talk about today is the energy that we as an industry, manufacturers, uh, contractors, and end, end users, the energy that we need to expend to keep our fire sprinklers in order. There are basically five types of corrosion identified. Number one is galvanic. And galvanic uh, corrosion occurs when two metals with different electrochemical charges are linked together. And, and when, you hear, when you hear people talking about anodes and cathodes and, and the movement of metal ions from one to the other, from an anodic material to a cathodic material, that is what's uh, being described uh, is galvanic corrosion. The second type of corrosion is what's called stress corrosion cracking. So when you take metal uh, like a fire sprinkler frame and you put it under stress, right? We have we have links and we have bulbs and we have things like that that are putting the frame under stress. Uh, and other materials, uh, CPVC for instance, we have stress cracking, not necessarily corrosion, a uh, different type of uh, chemical reaction going on. Uh, but we have stress corrosion cracking. So little cracks form and then these become the target uh, for corrosion. And uh, in its final state, you either have uh, damage that can't be repaired or you have just massive failure uh, of the piece of equipment. We have what's called general corrosion. Uh, general corrosion, rust, steel, uh, rust is, a, is an example, but steel, oxygen, and water put together uh, is also an electrical chemical, electrochemical reaction, but because we don't have a strong electrical current, the corrosion occurs uniformly across a surface. We have what's called localized corrosion. Localized corrosion, think about the pitting on the inside of galvanized pipe, 
Uh, and if you've seen any of the uh, information again, they read the articles, look at the watch the webinars that are being given on nitrogen. A lot of times they're talking about the the very localized pitting that occurs when you have a breach in the surface, uh, and then the uh, what the uh, a small part of it comes in contact with what's called the corrosion stressing uh, cause. And, and it works alongside other processes in the case of the inside of pipe with MIC and things like that uh, to create that very, very localized um, uh, corrosion, which again, which pitting and piping uh, is an example of. And then finally, we have what's called caustic agent corrosion. So when impure elements like a hydrogen sulfide, for instance, uh, wear a metal down, uh, in the presence usually of moisture. That's what's called caustic agent corrosion. So those are the five basic different types. And here are some examples of those. If you've ever worked around a water heater that's been sitting around for a long time, this is a very common occurrence when you don't have a what's called a dielectric union between the two, uh, the two uh, anode and the cathode. So you have this, this movement of material that's actually leaching across from one to the other. Um, that's a galvanic corrosion. Here's a, a case of a stress um, corrosion cracking. Uh, where might else you see this on the inside of a roll groove, right? On a galvanized piping, you have a, a breach in that surface, and we see again the potential for the localized corrosion happening there. Here's what's uh, generally referred to as just uniform rust, right? We've all seen that before. Uh, and then finally, the uh, localized pitting. Uh, in this case, a pinhole or or what looks more like maybe a penhole to me. That's a pretty large breach in the piping. That's some localized corrosion from the inside that's worked its way out. And then finally, uh, the caustic agent corrosion, which is the again some sort of a corrosive that's uh, usually in the presence of water that's sitting on the metal, just simply eating it away over time. So what else comes into play here is temperature. Um, uh, we had someone in the office here a few years back talking to us. Was, the person happened to be a chemist. I believe that the uh, that the statement was something like uh, for every 18 plus or minus degrees of temperature raise, uh, chemical reactions double in nature. Um, so when you have high temperature, if there's uh, and there always is a minimum amount of energy to, to begin the corrosion when the temperature is higher, you always have more energy to create the corrosion again when that when that temperature is increased. This is why a lot of times you will see uh, in warehouses that are near the open doors. If you're in a warm environment, uh, you'll see uh, corrosion occur more on the inside of the piping near the front doors where it's warmer all the time. So temperature plays a big part in the uh, corrosion as well. So what are the concerns? with the fire sprinkler itself and corrosion? Well, number one, the pre-op. Okay, this again, everyone knows what this is probably that's listening. This is a fire sprinkler that, that fails uh, and opens and releases water, uh, unless it's a pre-action system, but uh, generally is releasing water when we don't want it to. So over time, the fire sprinkler just simply fails either due to the stress corrosion cracking uh, or whatever type of uh, corros corrosion has occurred, fire sprinkler opens water discharges. So pre-op is one concern. And then the second concern is a non-op. So fire sprinklers that become so corroded or so loaded that they simply will not open or are extremely delayed in opening in a fire event. Uh, so those are those are the concerns, but there's also one more concern that's out there that's not necessarily um, too, you know, of too much interest. Wow, that's not maybe the nicest way to phrase it from a manufacturing standpoint, but but from the reality standpoint, and that's that's what I would call the beauty pageant, um, the beauty pageant concern. Right, and that is, oh my gosh, we put in these fire sprinklers and they look horrible now. Um, and we get that, we understand it, we're, we're proud of the product we make. We like them to look good. We like to walk into buildings and see fire sprinklers up there. They're nice and bright and shiny. Um, but the reality is from the, from the standpoint of manufacturing and the UL and FM listing, the appearance of the fire sprinkler uh, is not 
of huge concern to us. Uh, and, and so we need to separate that out. Oftentimes we were requested to look at fire sprinklers simply because they don't look good. And that's uh, that's not really something that's that's in our, uh, you know, our wheelhouse. We, we want to understand what's happening with them. But the reality is we're more concerned about will they function in the event of a fire? So um, again, what what is the real concern? We need to identify that. So when we talk about corrosion and, and the ones we just talked about, the five different types, we're talking about corrosion from the outside in, right? It, it's what's happening. We've got the sprinkler sitting in an environment. You know, something's happening. The, the sprinkler there on the right, we can see we've got some discoloration, some desinkification, whatever it is that's happening there. Uh, the, 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 sorry, that was the one on the left. The one on the right, uh, I, again, I don't know if that came off the Titanic or what, but that fire sprinkler has been, you know, severely, severely affected from, from the outside. It's not always the outside, however. It's not always the outside. Oftentimes there are things happening within the pipe that become of a concern or are brought to our attention. So here's an example uh, of some of the, the issues that as a manufacturer we, we have to address and we get pictures like this. Now, if it, this were me and I saw something like this leaching through my faucet at home, I probably wouldn't call the faucet manufacturer and I'm not saying that to be offensive to anyone, but something is happening inside that pipe that's causing this. This, this is not the result of a fire sprinkler failure. Uh, this is a result of uh, some sort of an antifreeze, some chemical additive, some extremely high pressures that are maybe pushing past the seat, but it's really what's happening inside the pipe when you see something like this, uh, we can change that fire sprinkler out, put it back in, and who knows how much longer uh, you're going to have the same issue. So something's happening internally with that pipe that needs to be addressed. We're happy to look at these and let you know that, but but be aware that that's the lo most likely responses that you're going to get is, you know, have you done a water sample and really what's going on inside that pipe? Because it's obvious that, that the fire sprinkler did not make that, that gel-like material. I don't even, in this case, know what that is. Uh, and then we see issues like this. This is a, a, you know, this fire sprinkler, no telling how long it's been um, installed, but the fire sprinkler itself looks in good shape. Uh, the bulb is in good shape, the seat's in good shape, but we've obviously had some leakage uh, around the threads um, that could be uh, out of tolerance uh, weld to let. Um, it could be an out of tolerance thread on the fire sprinkler, uh, maybe simply wasn't made in. Perhaps the, uh, the uh, pressure within the piping uh, has gone up over what it was tested at. There's no telling, but in this case, it's relatively obvious that that type of corrosion um, is affecting the fire sprinkler, but it's not the result of the fire sprinkler. So again, we, we hope as manufacturers that someone takes the time to, you know, stop and think about what's happening uh, before simply saying, oh, my, my fire sprinklers are corroding, uh, which they do. They do, but oftentimes it's very simple to tell when it's the fire sprinkler and when it's not. So as uh, Lindsay, Lindsay mentioned in the opening, we're gonna talk about uh, requirements out of the two documents, the two primary documents that, uh, that we all deal with and that are gonna apply to this situation. And those are gonna be obviously NFPA 13 and NFPA 25. And let's talk about NFPA 13 first. What are the specific requirements that are in NFPA 13? So, as we all know, in the beginning of NFPA standards, uh, usually around chapter three, we have a whole bunch of definitions. And in the case of NFPA 13, obviously no different. We have the definition of a corrosion resistant sprinkler. These are out of the 2019 edition, by the way. So you can read what it says. I take exception to a couple things in this definition. Uh, and we maybe we'll look at changing these in the next cycle or, or whenever the uh, whenever that avails itself. But number one, um, this definition is giving us guidance on where we're supposed to use 
these fire sprinklers. That is not what definitions in NFPA 13 are for. That's what uh, the further chapters in the standard are for. So um, it, we, we would want to look at that as an industry and just clean that up. It's not the biggest issue in the world, but, but be aware that definitions really aren't meant to give us guidance on where to uh, where and what to do with things. Now, the other part of that of this statement that that concerns me a little bit is that part where it says in an atmosphere that would normally corrode sprinklers. So every every atmosphere will normally corrode sprinklers. Every atmosphere will normally corrode sprinklers. The question is how fast is that going to occur? And that's what we really need to be talking about. So I, I think we could probably use a new definition here and I would suggest something like this. A sprinkler fabricated with corrosion resistant material or with special coatings or platings used to slow the effects of corrosion. That's all we can do. That is all we can do is simply slow those uh, the effects of the corrosion. So what do we have to do as a manufacturer to get fire sprinklers listed? Uh, Lindsay also mentioned the two major approval agencies or listing agencies, UL and FM. Let's start by taking a look at what F or excuse me, what UL requires for all fire sprinklers. And then we'll look at how do you get a corrosion resistant listing? All fire sprinklers must pass successful operational tests after 10 day exposure to 20% salt spray. 20% salt spray is 200 parts per thousand. The average ocean salinity is around 35 parts per thousand. So a very, very concentrated salt spray uh, for a 10 day period. A moist hydrogen sulfide air mix. So hydrogen sulfide, sulfide is a poisonous, corrosive, and flammable gas, right? It's produced from the decay of organic matter. Uh, think about a swamp or a sewer, for instance. Uh, the, the, the gases that are produced in the absence of oxygen is what we're talking about here. Now we're going to mix those with moisture and we're going to let those sit on the fire sprinkler for 10 days and we're going to then put it through testing and it must pass. And again, these are the rules for all fire sprinklers, not corrosion resistant, but for all fire sprinklers. Moist CO2 and sulfur dioxide air mix. So we all know what CO2 is, the waste product of us breathing. It's also the, the fuel for plants to use for photosynthesizing uh, carbohydrates, uh, you know, using sunlight. Uh, other natural sources, it comes out of volcanoes, hot springs, geysers, uh, and it, uh, it, it, you know, it basically is around us all the time. Um, sulfur dioxide is produced from burning fossil fuels, right? Our vehicles right now. And also it's produced from smelting mineral ores that contain sulfur and it dissolves very easily in water to form sulfuric acid. So what are we talking about here? Acid rain, right? We, we talked about um, the um, uh, corrosive caustic uh, nature of that being one of the, the five types. This is what we're talking about here, the acid rain and uh, that we, you know, don't hear a lot about of, but man, back in the, maybe it was the seventies or eighties, it was a big thing. So, uh, and then finally, there's an additional test, uh, which is called the 90 day moist air test. The fire sprinklers are exposed uh, to three months worth of uh, moist air at 205 degrees. Why the 205? Again, to, to dramatically accelerate any effects of the corrosion that might occur from water. And if you didn't know, water is referred to as the universal solvent. Water dissol dissolves more substances than any other solvent known to man. So water over time will essentially degrade virtually everything. So that's all sprinklers have to pass those tests. What do we need to get for commercial or for a <laughs> commercial riser? Sure, for a corrosion resistant sprinkler. Well, we simply take the three tests that we talked about. We're going to drop off the 90 day uh, moist air test. We're going to run those tests for 30 days and then we're going to pass 
testing, operational testing of those fire sprinklers. So why do we drop the the 90 day moist air test? Well, it, it's hard to do a 90 day moist air test in 30 days. Uh, and that's a little bit of a joke. Um, but the moist air test anticipates that all sprinklers uh, will face the effects of moisture, whether they're corrosion resistant or not. So basically all sprinklers are validated to that moist air test to that 90 day period. That is how we get a UL listed corrosion resistant sprinkler. Factory Mutual, FM Global, uh, what do we need to do there? Well, the rules are basically the same. 10 day exposure test to salt spray, moist hydrogen sulfide, moist CO2 and sulfur dioxide, 90 day moist air test. FM takes it one level further, however, and they actually uh, make us pass a corrosion stress cracking test. So what does this mean? Um, for stain, uh, for two parts, if, uh, if we're using copper parts, they're subjected to a 10 day moist ammonia environment. It's a 35% anhydrous ammonia at 93 degrees, again, elevated temperature uh, to see if those parts will, will pass uh, testing after uh, being exposed to that. And if they're stainless steel parts, uh, it's subjected to 500 hours of exposure to boiling magnesium chloride. I don't know about you, that doesn't sound like a fun bath. Um, but boiling magnesium chloride, these chemicals are selected because they, uh, because they affect those particular materials. So those tests are added for all fire sprinklers for Factory Mutual. How do we get corrosion resistant fire sprinklers for Factory Mutual? We just simply do all of those tests for 30 days, but we drop those last two again. Um, again, uh, if they pass the test, there's no sense uh, making them continue on for any further length of time. So corrosion resistant sprinklers for FM and UL at the end of the day, uh, essentially 30 day tests to those three chemicals pass the operational test within a, an allowed um, range to the uh, to one side or the other. Obviously, they're generally going to be a little bit slower or take a little more pressure, but they they uh, they will pass the testing. So let's look at the types of sprinklers. And when I say types of sprinklers, we're typically going to be referring to the solder or the uh, thermal element uh, as the defining feature of the fire sprinkler because that's really determines what we can do to make them corrosion resistant. Number one, and, and these are reliable sprinklers, but all manufacturers are going to have some, some version of this. Um, this is the reliable Model G with our solder capsule standard response link. It's been around for, you know, the better part of 40 years. Again, standard response uh, solder capsule. You might also have a thick um, um, metal alloy link. We've seen those as well. That would fall into this category. The newer fast response links, the thin alloys that are soldered together. Um, and again, uh, these are always fast response. Finally, we're gonna have quick or let's say fast response for lack of, of to, to be more proper, a fast response thermal bulb, two and a half or three millimeter, and then a standard res response thermal element glass bulb as well, typically five millimeters. So again, what are we looking at here? It's, it's this type of sprinkler or more appropriately the, the thermal element that's gonna pretty much determine our ability to make it corrosion resistant. And the one thing that we can't do uh, has not been perfected yet or, or uh, been approved yet is being able to protect the second one from the left, the fast response thin um, uh, metal links. They're, they're simply by adding some sort of a corrosion resistant uh, coating on them uh, would in essence turn that fast response link into a standard response link. Now that could be done, um, but again, the, re the reason that that link is in there is because we need that fast activation time. So simply slowing it down really doesn't do us a lot of good. So the reality is for corrosion resistant, we're gonna be looking at one of these three types of sprinklers. Now we have two ways to, to essentially prevent corrosion or slow down, 
factors. I said it, didn't I? Prevent corrosion. We have two ways to slow down corrosion. Uh, number one, and been around for a long time, is a lead plating. And these aren't done just kind of willy nilly by Reliable or the other manufacturers. In the case of Reliable, it's done to a to a, a, a very um, defined military spec mill standard 171 for, for lead plating. We can uh, also take wax uh, in the case of uh, in the case of most manufacturers. It's it's pretty straightforward. It's beeswax. It's um, altered to melt at a slightly different temperature so that we have a uh, a, mac, a wax that will melt at a lower temperature. Uh, we use those on the on the 165 ish range sprinklers. And then we also put uh, brown coloring in it to help define it in the field. Uh, and that's a higher temperature um, uh, rated beeswax as well. So uh, essentially what that's doing is preventing those contaminants from getting onto the metal is what we're doing there in both those cases. And then um, a, a better option, and I remember, and I want to say in, in the early days of my uh, experience, probably around 1978, I think we used the term coro proof back then and we just simply don't use that term anymore but a wax over lead would would back in the day would have been called wow we were going to use this coro proof head uh and wax over lead was kind of the the bee the beeswax back then so to speak um then we can also put another type of coating on the fire sprinklers um and, and again most cases manufacturers are using polyester paint uh, polyester as everyone should know is a plastic right it's it's essentially embedded into the paint and the particular thing about polyester paint uh it's what's referred to as a thermosetting plastic so once it sets up it will not melt um a nylon paint for instance if you used a nylon paint uh, that's a, considered a thermoplastic it would actually would melt under high temperature so we we use the polyester paint to again give us that protection from the outside elements in and then the last one is the electroless nickel Teflon, uh, Teflon being the registered trademark trademark of the DuPont company. Uh, electroless nickel plating has been around a long time. Uh, it, use fo it uses phosphorus in it as well. Uh, it's actually called ENP, uh, electroless nickel phosphorus plating. Uh, and what's happening here is that embedded into the electroless nickel uh, material is Teflon. Uh, bits and pieces. It's consistently embedded throughout that uh, coating. It's applied to the fire sprinkler in a, an electroless fashion, uh, and it provides a very good, again, um, uh, protection from outside elements getting into the into and onto the fire sprinkler uh, itself. The other thing that we can do rather than coating the fire sprinkler is to simply build it out of a material that is more corrosion resistant. In the case of Reliable, we offer uh, uh, essentially a uh, half inch and three quarter inch 5.6 8.0 upright pendants in stainless steel. And we also have the only uh, extended coverage 11.2 uh, fire sprinkler on the market that's available in stainless. That's the J112 SS or the uh, and again available in upright and pendant. Uh, and, and to just be fair with other manufacturers, they have different um, uh, ways to go about this. Uh, one manufacturer uses a higher grade of stainless, 254 stainless, uh, also called SMO. Uh, and the other manufacturer also, uh, you can get actually a, a titanium fire sprinkler. So everyone's uh, kind of skinned the cat in a little different way and uh, you would want to look at all those options depending on the uh, the need that you have at hand. So let's go back to NFPA 13 for a minute and let's take a look at just a couple of things here. The owner certificate. Um, we've seen and heard a lot about this. This is a requirement um, of, of a project to get an owner certificate filled out. One of the things that we ask for on the owner certificate is any special knowledge of the water supply. So this is kind of interesting, right? Think about a, an end user who's going to build a building in five different states. And we're expecting the owner to tell us what he knows about five different water supplies, right? Five different water purveyors, five different water departments. You, Mr. Owner, tell me what you know about those five 
um, different water supplies. That's a requirement. And you're probably wondering why I bring that up. It's it, I bring it up to point out a, 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 a something that's missing in the owner's requirement, in my opinion, and that would be this one. Number five, and again, I, I think we would look at getting this into the standard for the uh, for the owner certificate. You know, do you have any special knowledge about what's going to be occurring in your building? If that guy who's building five buildings in five different states is expected to know the water supply, he's certainly going to know more about what the environment in his building, which is going to be used for the same thing in those five states, there's going to be some consistency there between what's happening in the buildings. We could expect him to know that more than the water supply. So, you know, we we should probably ask him that question at bid time, uh, at design time, or whatever the case may be, because we really need to understand what's happening uh, within that building on the outside, not necessarily, well, in addition to the inside of the pipe. Then let's look at the installation uh, and the installation uh, requirements are here in 16.2. Uh, this is again where it tells us where we need to use these. OK, listed corrosion resistant sprinklers shall be installed in locations where chemicals, comma, moisture and other or other corrosive vapors sufficient to cause uh, corrosion of such devices exist shall be used where moisture is present. Now, what does sufficient nature mean? I, I don't know the answer to that. This is one of those very subjective things where you just go out. Well, I mean, is is 80% sufficient? Is 30% sufficient? I can't answer that question. Um, in the annex, there are some examples provided of these. There's 22 of them. Uh, there are certainly many more out in the world, but 22 are, are listed uh, driveways. All right, that's an interesting one. Uh, I didn't know we sprinkled a lot of driveways in the proper term, but I, I know what they're getting at here. Uh, and this is an interesting one, the way it's phrased as well. Areas exposed to outside weather, comma, such as piers and wharves exposed to salt air. So, you know, uh, words and punctuation have meaning. I don't know if they meant to have a comma after the word wharves because then it would be you would read that or could read that as areas exposed to outside weather and exposed to salt air. But without a comma there, areas exposed to outside weather, that would mean any time that fire sprinkler is exposed to outside weather, it need would potentially need to be corrosion resistant. I don't know if that was the, the intent here or not, but the way it reads is, in my opinion, almost every environment is, you know, has the potential to corrode. So in addition to this language in 16.2, there's also information about the uh, the coding application, right? It can only be done by the manufacturer. That just kind of makes sense. If you have something like a wax coated sprinkler and you damage the wax during installation, you you as the installer, the contractor are allowed to repair that with the correct material and then the processes that we would provide to you. So uh, that'd be pretty common, um, you know, to maybe knock some of that wax off as you're doing the installation. Um, NFPA again, here we're out of 13. We've installed our system. Now we got to look at NFPA 25 and see what's required after the installation. So the language here in 5.2 has been around for a while. What's happened in the past few years and maybe the past few additions is some language to help because it used to simply say corrosion and it used to simply say loading. Right now we have this this uh, this kind of qualifier that says detrimental to sprinkler performance. Again, a very subjective statement and who determines this? Well, at the end of the day, it's going to be the AHJ. He is the guy who's going to say yes or no. You can ask us, we may be able to give you some, some idea. You may, can also test those fire sprinklers and find out whether it's detrimental to sprinkler performance. So there are ways to get that done. Loading, I know we're not necessarily talking about loading, but loading by grease and, and dust and just things like that, um, detrimental to sprinkler performance. Now what's interesting about this is number six, paint. 
other than applied by us. Well, what about the paint? I mean, if corrosion can be defined as detrimental and loading can be defined as detrimental, why don't we say paint that is detrimental to the sprinkler performance? If I have a, a couple of drops of paint on the frame arm of a white sprinkler that the owner doesn't care about, uh, why would we change that fire sprinkler out? The reason you would change it out is because the AHJ said so. But with by adding something like this detrimental to sprinkler performance, now all of a sudden we can look at that and say, okay, that's not going to affect it. And I think this is this is the evolution of the standards to help the ITM industry uh, address some of these issues. But at the end of the day, we all know when we need to replace fire sprinklers. That that should be no question uh, in this case. So in the annex, you're going to find some additional language um, that to help you out. You know, sprinklers having limited corrosion or loading that does not impact the water distribution characteristics. That's the other side of it. If I can look at that fire sprinkler and go, yeah, it's still going to operate, but it's so loaded that the that the water spray is going to be affected. Uh, then we have to do something else. But if if everything else looks good, um, we can test it. And we can, if the if the test passed, then we can come back and test it again later. So, so that information has now been added. Just be aware it's there. It might help you with your AHJs down the road. Um, and then finally, this last one, surface discoloration, uh, white poly frames with green spots on them and, and the fire sprinkler that you see here. Um, that discoloration over time is gonna turn into something worse. But uh, it, you would have to just look at it and go, it, it's not going to uh, impact the performance of that fire sprinkler. It's still going to operate. So uh, some information has been added over the over the course of the standards to, to help us out there. So what about cleaning of fire sprinklers? Well, they can be cleaned, but only if they are loaded with a coating of dust. OK, um, if it's a, if it's loaded with grease or some other um, like we saw in that picture before, maybe it's, uh, uh, you know, maybe it's spray on uh, 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 fireproofing or, or, you know, something like that, uh, drywall, things like that that have gotten sprayed on. Um, those can't be cleaned. They they need to be replaced. And and uh, uh, again, the word of warning from the standard is, you know, do not touch the sprinkler. Um, you know, it, it you can go out there with the with the shop back and bounce around that fire sprinkler and feel confident that you haven't damaged it. But the reality is, you may have damaged it, and you're only going to see the effects uh, in a week or two weeks or whatever. Um, so again, uh, cleaning allowed for dust only. So what about the trim of the fire sprinkler? Well, the reality is for the most part, the trim falls into the beauty pageant column, okay? Um, in, if, in fact, over the years, I've heard these referred to as beauty rings. Uh, some people will call them that. Um, they do need to be in place for a recessed or a uh, or a concealed fire sprinkler. They do need to be in place. So if they've corroded to the fact where they've fallen out of the sky, uh, they do need to be replaced. And uh, and that goes for the cover plates on the concealed fire sprinklers as well. Um, the standard tells us if listed, if the listed escutcheons. Now everyone needs to remember that when we test recessed fire sprinklers, they are tested with our escutcheons and trim rings. When we test concealed sprinklers, they are, they are tested with our cover plates. You may be able to find one that fits, but it's not the listed uh, cover, or cover plate or escutcheon ring that goes on there. If you can't find the listed escutcheons or cover plates, they're no longer available, you can't go out and, and just use a willy-nilly grab a part that fits and put it on there. You must replace the fire sprinklers and that's it. and that's in there because they were tested with a particular product. Once you add something aftermarket, um, it, there's no telling the response that, uh, that the fire sprinkler is going to get. So again, um, we can't get, uh, as of today, and I'm not sure we ever will, there is no UL or FM standard for corrosion-resistant trim rings. Right? It doesn't exist. 
But what we can do and what we have done as an industry is to provide some options for you to help with that kind of beauty pageant side of it and help make that uh, make that fire sprinkler in, a, in, in its finished state look better longer. Um, so uh, Reliable offers a selection of stainless steel, uh, trim our standard F1 or F2, um, the FP, the thread in, uh, the third one from the left there, a surface mount, a uh, single piece of scutcheon. And then finally for the uh, concealed sprinklers, we offer a stainless steel clad cover plate. And that's a that's a great addition, particularly if you're in an outside environment on dry pendant sprinklers uh, to add that extra level uh, of protection from the outside elements. So we're getting close to the end here. What can we do? Right, that was the topic at hand. What can be done? What can't be done? So, what number one? What can be done? What needs to be done? Educate your customer. Right, educate. Make sure the guy understands uh, what's going to happen if the situation is not addressed, uh, and help him. Uh, you know, down the road when the time comes to say those those fire sprinklers are looking pretty bad, they may need replaced. And he says, well, they've only been there for you know 12 years. Well, you know, again, it, it, it's an environmental issue. So he, they need to be educated. And part of that is to work with him to evaluate the environment. What is it that you're gonna be doing here? Are there, are there fumes and, and are you spraying these sprinklers with something to clean them? What is happening? Uh, once we've got that figured out, what can we do? We can follow the rules if they are available in 13, which would say corrosion resistant sprinklers of some sort in most cases. So we simply apply the rules in 13. If there, uh, if there are not rules, we can't quite figure it out. We can certainly make recommendations. We can offer an alternate to go to a corrosion resistant finish, at which point the owner then is, is invested in making that decision, right? I, uh, later on, uh, you hear Mr. Owner, you told me not to put these in. So uh, we talked about the fact that this might be happening. So, you know, make a recommendation to them. Don't be afraid to give them an alternate to go to the corrosion resistant. Uh, you, might be, you might be making a friend there and building the relationship. Um, finally, once it's installed, we can monitor the situation you know, take some ownership of, of your system that's been installed. Perhaps you're not the, uh, the NFPA 25 ITM contractor, but you could certainly stop into the job site in a year or two and, and talk to them about what's happening. Uh, it would help educate you as well for the future. And, and again, show that customer some interest, uh, long-term interest in, in his well-being and the well-being of his fire sprinkler system. And then finally, adapt as required. So we're, we're, we're going out, we're talking to the guy, Mr. Man, those fire sprinklers are looking bad. We, we thought this might happen. Let's talk about uh, getting uh, some capital in the in maybe next year's budget to get these replaced. And let's let's put in the, the next step maybe, or, or maybe we go the full boat all the way to stainless or whatever the case is. So, so those are the things that can be done. What cannot be done? Uh, and this goes for, for, the, for everyone we cannot anticipate all conditions it's simply impossible every environment is different and environments on parts of jobs can be different we dealt with an issue recently on a large uh, seven or eight floor parking structure where the ground floor is being used for rental car uh, ins and outs and uh, we're seeing some accelerated corrosion on the fire sprinklers that on floors two through seven or eight look pristine but on that particular floor because of what they do and other environmental conditions we see accelerated uh, corrosion out there so we can't anticipate all of this we can't test for them if we can't anticipate them we can't test for them now we could uh, uh, as a special request someone could come in and say we've got this chemical xyz in the environment we're worried about what these fire sprinklers are going to do we can test for that but again, remember there's no UL or FM test standard that would say at the end of the day that Reliable or any other manufacturer now has a corrosion resistant sprinkler listed for the presence of name your, name your poison. It, it simply doesn't exist. And so it would be a very specialized uh, report and, and product. Now we can't change the environment and and I got a little asterisk there because in most cases you can't change the environment but but why why the asterisk well 
let's say for instance a food processor is spraying cleaner and over time it's eating the fire sprinklers away well maybe he can change his cleaner you know rather than look at changing the fire sprinklers which only have a certain number of options perhaps there's another cleaner that won't necessarily uh, negatively impact the the fire sprinklers we cannot completely prevent corrosion it's a natural process that will not stop we can only slow it down and then finally none of us can stop trying we simply have just got to try to keep crack this nut and and improve the product improve the processes uh, as we move forward and try to help our owners out so final slide because it's natural which means mother nature is in control we're never going to stop corrosion it's simply impossible to do all we can do is slow it down mother nature is always going to win so with that being said a reminder um, please get your contact information into the chat box so that we can get you your certificate at this point i'm going to turn it over for a for a brief presentation by george nicola technical services manager out of fort myers florida and he's going to fill us in on a little experiment that reliable's got going a little real world experiment with regard to fire sprinklers take it away george all right well uh, thank you carrie and hello everybody uh, as you probably recognize if you're looking at that particular peninsula that's on your screen that is the state of florida and while we're typically known for things like palm trees and beaches and if you're in my part of the world on the west coast some pretty extravagant sunsets um, we are also known for things like fishing and boating right because it's it, we're surrounded on three sides by water and most importantly we're known by golf and i, and I had to show you that shot because that truly is my, my, on a par three, my tee shot six inches from the hole. And so since I'll never have the opportunity to show anybody that shot again, uh, I figured I would share with as many people as I possibly could. So there you go. But anyway, as you know, the state of Florida is surrounded on three sides by water. So obviously to the west, we have the Gulf of Mexico. To the east, we have the Atlantic Ocean. And then to the south, we have what what are called the Straits of Florida, which essentially run along the Keys and separate uh, uh, the U.S. mainland from the uh, country of Cuba. And while we're known for kind of this lush, green, beautiful uh, flora and fauna that we have here, we also have scenarios like this. Uh, as Carrie mentioned, moisture is a problem for fire sprinklers. And there are days in the summertime where when I go outside in the morning, you can literally see the moisture dripping off the trees. And obviously we have a, a, some, some pretty substantial winds that carry the salinity from, from the surrounding waterways to, uh, in a lot of cases, five to 10 miles inland, which obviously creates a problem. And you know, I, I actually moved to Florida from Buffalo, New York, so I was familiar with snow drifts. Uh, the picture on the, on the lower right uh, actually uh, is is interesting because it's actually f what you see is wind that's blowing sand and when I got to Florida I actually had some roadways that were closed because of sand drifts in the middle of the roadways which I didn't even realize was possible and as a result of of this scenario and as a result of these um, types of conditions that we find in Florida we also it's not unusual for us to find pipe that looks like this and when we find pipe like this, we typically find sprinklers that look like these as well. So while I, you know, as Carrie mentioned, it's not a beauty contest and that is not our intention. Really, the challenge is that at the end of the day, we understand that you have customers that are interested in what that product looks like. So um, uh, this is actually a, a site that I visited yesterday. And this is a, a location not too far from me in Naples, Florida. So you can see uh, in the picture on the left, obviously a pretty pretty place. And if you look at the satellite image that you see on the right, you can see that it's located uh, relatively close to the Gulf of Mexico. Now, the challenge here is really this, is that while you can see that there's kind of this open corridor here, if you're looking at the satellite image, right? This, this open uh, area in the middle, uh, the challenge is that it's also open in these four areas between the wings. 
So what happens is when we get wind that comes off the Gulf, it actually comes into this courtyard area and it swirls around the courtyard, which creates a problem for us. So, so here's a couple of sprinklers. The sprinkler on the left is a sprinkler that's been in place for six or seven years. And as you can see, the sprinkler looks pretty pristine and beautiful. And it is located about, I'm going to say, 15 feet from the sprinkler that you see on the right there. Now, the sprinkler on the right has all already been changed out twice. It started out as a white poly sprinkler like the one on the left. It got so bad that it was changed to another white poly on the left. Then it was changed to this PTFE finish or, or nickel uh, electroless nickel finish that you see on the right. And the fire marshal has just come in and he's he's actually required that that sprinkler be changed again. He sees enough corrosion on the seat of that sprinkler that he believes it needs to be changed. Now, as Kerry mentioned, this is not just a reliable problem. This is an industry problem. There's actually a building that's located about a thousand feet away from from this building that has a similar courtyard structure. And in that particular building, that sprinkler, uh, they're looking at changing all their sprinklers in in their central courtyard, and they've been in place for less than a year. So, so what are we doing on the experiment side? Uh, I'm really glad you guys asked me that question. So we started out by building these multiple headers that you see here. So you can see that you've got a, a header that includes uprights, a header that includes pendants. As I mentioned before, there's always a concern that if you locate those sprinklers too far away from each other, that they react differently in the environment, that the wind patterns are different or whatever. So we've located each of these sprinklers on basically six inch increments. We filled the piping with water. We've got ball valves on each end of the headers that you can't see there. And then we have six different finishes that we've included on each header to try and get an idea of from a beauty pageant standpoint, what are you going to be able to see when these, these have been installed for a while? So, so as I said, we've got six finishes. We've got the white polyester finish. Um, it's probably our most popular finish and it is the one that you're going to see installed most often. It also, you can see we've got the upright there, we've got the pendant there. The pendant there also includes the a white polyester uh, discussion plate. Okay, we've got a brand new super secret finish. Um, and this is honestly not a finish that Reliable currently produces, but it is one that we are evaluating in this test. As you can see, uh, the finish for the upright and the pendant is the same. We also have the same finish on this particular discussion, so we're interested to see how this sprinkler is going to perform in this environment as well. But a third finish is just a brass sprinkler, and quite honestly, we don't expect these to do very well in any of our environments, but um, it's kind of a control sprinkler. We, our, our hope is that we'll be able to measure, if we look at the way these corrode, we'll be able to compare how other finishes corrode in relation to how this sprinkler corrodes. And since we don't use a whole lot of brass escutcheons, we decided to use a chrome escutcheon with our headers uh, in the picture on the left. We've got the PTFE or the, or the nickel Teflon finish. Um, one thing that's important to realize here is both the upright and the pendant obviously include that finish. The discussions do not. We have found in a number of locations in Florida where we use the, uh, initially when we introduced the sprinkler, we had an discussion that was also coated with the, with the same uh, coating, but those discussions just did not perform well. The sprinkler seemed to do decently well, but the discussions themselves did not perform well. So in this case where you see the pendant discussion, we're actually using a stainless steel discussion with it. We have a black polyester or a black poly finish, which is essentially the same as the white, except uh, in a different color. And then finally, we have the stainless steel, which obviously we expect is going to perform the best. Uh, the question is at what price point and does it make sense for you? Does it make sense for your customer? So, um, this is my you know, my location here. I'm located here in Estero. And uh, the first location where we installed one of these headers is out here on Longboat Key. So it's about uh, maybe a two hour drive for me. And as you look at this, okay, uh, if you look at the satellite image that you see in the middle, that blue dot is actually going to represent where these headers are actually installed. So the two pictures that you see both on the left and on the right are taken from about right here. 
So when I look to my left, I took a picture of the beach on the left. When I look to my right, just beyond this hedge line that you see here is our building. And that is the building that we've actually installed these headers in. So that was actually uh, installed. 917 was our install date. My first visit back to that site will be next week. So we'll 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 try and look at them on a on a 30 day rotating basis to get an idea for for how each sprinkler is performing. And these are where our headers are installed. If you look in the background, one of the things that you're going to be able to see is the the piping and the existing sprinkler protection behind there. Now, for those of you that are wondering, yes, I did go back up and yes, I did remove the protective caps that you see on the sprinklers uh, on the uh, on the pendant on the pendants there. So all right, second location that we chose was I figured we would just go down to the southernmost point. We would just take a header and mount it right to the uh, to the monument that marks that. But the law, law enforcement officials did not think that was a really good idea. So we ended up moving to a location that's about 23 miles northeast of that in an, in an area called Summerlin Key. Now, this is probably the area in Florida where you're going to find the stiffest winds. And this is our location when you look at that from a satellite image standpoint. So again, if you're looking out, we're actually, the sprinklers are actually installed uh, underneath the building uh, that's that's uh, shown next to the, just right of the blue dot there. And um, uh, you can see that the ladder that you see in the picture on the right is actually where that sprinkler has been installed. You can see that these are the mangroves here, which are these mangroves here, and the water line actually starts, oh, no more than, uh, it's probably not 30 or 40 yards away from the building where where the sprinklers are actually installed. Our third location is over here in Jupiter. Now, the challenge with the one in Jupiter has been uh, that they're, they're a little COVID scared right now, so I haven't been able to go get there yet to install that header, but the expectation is that we will be there next week or the following week. And as a result of that, we'll, we'll have uh, sprinklers installed three different locations uh, on three different waterways, essentially. And that should give us a really good idea of how finishes are going to perform. We're going to evaluate those finishes on a on a 30 day basis over the next 12 months to 18 months. And hopefully at the end of that time, we'll be able to give you a really good idea of which sprinklers perform best and at which price point. And then maybe you can make a more intelligent decision as to which one best suits your customer. And then the last thing we have is just the CPV C header that you see here. And what we're going to try and do is get a couple of these installed in some pool rooms, um, some chemical rooms where we can kind of see where those finishes uh, perform as well. Uh, that, that's been a little more challenging to actually get people to install those because they have to be installed in, in so-called finished areas and it's been a little more of a challenge. But we do expect that we will have a couple of those mounted in various locations as well. And hopefully, you know, like I said, 12 months, 18 months, 24 months from now, we're going to be able to give you some really good data as far as how our sprinklers performed and, uh, you know, what might be the best choice for your customer in certain situations. And with that, I'm sure Kerry would be happy to take any questions that you have. Thank, Thank you, George. George. Um, uh -huh. I'm getting some feedback that I wasn't getting before, but anyway, um, Brandon, do we have anything on the Q&A? No, you did <laughs> such a thorough job. There's not one single question. Or attendee. <laughs> no, I can't yeah. see that. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. If you're still out there, we appreciate it. As always, uh, stay safe. And uh, if you need assistance from Reliable, 1-800-55-RASCO.